And now, it's time for another Dice Tower Review with Tom Vassell. Hey everybody, I'm Tom Vassell. Today we're taking a look at Viscounts of the West Kingdom. This is the third game in a second trilogy from Shen Phillips. First he had the uh, Raiders of the North Sea, and he had three games in that series, and then there was the West Kingdom trilogy, Architects of the West Kingdom, Paladins of the West Kingdom. This is the third one, Viscounts of the West Kingdom. I really enjoyed Architects, and I liked Paladins a little bit more than Architects, so I was very excited about the third one here, even if I did not know how to pronounce Viscounts for the longest time. So let's take a look at what's inside this game and we'll be back. Here we go. Each player in this game is going to have a board with a bunch of different buildings on it, and you also have some corruption. You have a corruption track in front of you. You have this line of cards that comes in front of you. You have a corruption marker, a virtue marker, and then you have some uh, a place where you're going to be playing cards, and players will have their own starting deck. Each player has the same cards that are in their deck, but these aren't the only cards you're going to have. There's a bunch of starting characters and you're going to be pairing these up with these cards and starting from the last player a player is going to pick a card this card is going to show where your vi count starts on the board it gives you a bunch of starting resources although you also might start with some debts here and so there are going to be different cards and you have to pick which one you think is the best one to get and so players are also going to be comparing that as it's going to be paired with a character or one of these starting characters so you have to figure out the best ones to get once you have that you're going to be shuffling your deck and putting it in here next to the board. Now the way the game is going to be played is players are going to have a handful of three character cards and on your turn you're going to be playing a card. Uh, first you'll take any cards that have already been played and shuffle them over and they're going to move off the board and there are some characters that when they move off the board something will happen. Some characters will have something happen when you play them and there's all different types of characters but characters the biggest thing about characters is they have icons on the side of them that are going to help you as you take different actions. Now, when you play a character card here on the board, you'll notice at the beginning of the game there's icons printed here, so those icons, all icons in a character, are going to match whatever action you take. But you're also going to be moving your Vi count equal to the number of the cost of the character that you've played. So in this case it would be one, while if I played the Abbot, I would be moving my Vi count two. This is all happening on this board here. Each player has a Vi count, and you must move the full amount of spaces. So if you move one, you just follow the arrows. I'd move here. If I was here, I could move to this spot or down to this spot. If I'm two, I can't move here, except I could. I could go one, two like that. But if I was moving three, I couldn't stop in this spot. You got to be exact, but you can move up and down if possible, maybe to slow yourself down. Then depending on where you stop, you're going to get an action. There are four different types of actions. Two of them take place on the outer side, ring of the board, and two of them take place on the inner ring. Now there's a stack of cards in each location, and this is important for two reasons. When you take whatever action you're taking, you can pay that amount of money shown on the card, and you will get the icons that are listed there added to your action. The card is then discarded out of the game. Also, at the end of your turn, you have the opportunity to buy this card for that cost and put it in your discard pile, adding this card to your deck. So it gives you a chance to buy cards that will help your deck get better as time goes by. So let's take a look at the four different actions that are included with this game after moving. The first is trade. Trade is an action you'll do quite a bit. It, uh, it uses the bags, and depending on what spot you're in, you will get resources. So this one, for example, shows two trading icons give you one gold. So if I had four trading icons, I would be able to get two gold. Here, three trading icons lets me get rid of a card and out of, out of my deck. Maybe I don't want that card anymore. So different spots, like for example here you can see, gives you money. There's different resources you're trying to get. This is the main way to get resources. Another thing you can do on the outside of the board is you can build a building. You're going to need a certain number of building icons to do that, and then you're going to pick 
one of your buildings here, and it all depends on which kind of building you're building. So you can see that these three buildings here cost three building icons, these cost five, these cost seven. At the end of the game, you're going to get points depending on how many buildings you've built of each type. Also, as you build buildings, they're going to give you special abilities. Like, for example, when I build this building here, I now have an extra hammer for use of, with building for the rest of the game. Uh, this one here gives me an extra two bags when I use that action for the rest of the game. So there's various actions. And then when you do the building, you're going to place the building on the board here. You'll get whatever it says inside. So this is a resource of my choice. And if there's another building built, let's say Yellow had a building built here, then both players get to do whatever actions in between them. So if there's a dotted line in between them, you will also get that action. Transcribing manuscripts, there's piles of scrolls that are inside the board. This is an action that's done inside the board. You'll use a certain number of these and you will take the manuscript. You'll get the immediate action on it, or sometimes they have endgame scoring on them. You're also going to keep these for endgame scoring. You'll notice this has a yellow ribbon on it, and I'm trying to collect sets of four different color ribbons because that's going to be bonus points at the end of the game. So I'm going for those points at the end of the game, but I'm also going for the immediate thing or like for example this one here gives me an extra point that's what that yellow ribbon means for each building that I have and then finally the last thing that you can do the last action here is adding workers placing workers players have a pile of workers and you're going to be paying to put out a certain number of workers on the board um, that's actually listed on your board here so it shows, for example, it's going to cost me eight icons to put four workers out, three icons to put two workers out. And when you do that, wherever your Viscount is, you'll be adding workers to that section. What's cool is once you have three workers in a section, then one of them moves up a level, one moves to the right, and one moves to the left, which could, if you had some workers there, cause a cascading effect and make them go up too. At the end of the game, you're going to get points based on how high these people are in this central area, but also going to the middle is going to give you various bonuses. All these actions use the different icons on the card. So you can see this missionary, for example, helps with trading and with transcribing scrolls. Um, cards are also useful because sometimes when you buy them or use them for these icons, you'll get another benefit. This lets you discard a card. And there's also these here. These skulls are essentially wild. They can be used for any of the actions. Why wouldn't you want them? Well, by having skulls on your thing, and there's different ways this will happen over the course of the game, you can get corruption. Corruption will move your corruption token this way. And when these two tokens meet, you have to deal with that at the end of your turn. The top part of where they meet is going to happen to you, which if the corruption token is all the way over here is worse for you. I get three debts. I do get some money, but I get debts. And if they get meet all the way over here, it's good for me. I'll get three property deeds. Uh, and then the bottom part will happen to all the other players. So we've been talking a bit about debts and deeds. Let me show you. Debts are bad. They're minus two points. Deeds are good. They're worth one point. There are many actions in the game, though, that let you flip them. A deed goes from one point to three points. Hooray! And a debt goes from negative two points to, well, not negative two points, and a resource of your choice. Hooray! Both of those are good. And resources themselves are good. You may have wondered, I haven't mentioned much about resources, because resources can be used as icons when doing the different actions. Like, for example, inkwells can be used for transcribing things. Gold can be used for moving workers into the building. And stone is used to build buildings outside around the edge of the board. But what's really important are these deeds and debt piles because you're going to stick these cards in them. This card's stuck in the debt pile. This one's stuck in a deed pile. And they're stuck a certain distance down based on the number of players. When there's enough debts or deeds out, and this is going to happen because you're going to collide here enough that it's going to happen, if the debts run out, that makes the deeds very valuable. Whoever has, so this is in the debt pile, at that point, whoever has the most flip deeds is going to get 12 points at the end the game, eight and four for second and third. While if the deeds run out, that makes flip debts or paid off debts valuable. So it's kind of a balancing act. The more deeds that go out, the more valuable debts become, and the more debts that go out, the more valuable deeds become. 
That's also an end game trigger. There's a lot of different ways to score points in an end game. I'll just show you the last page of the rule book. You get them for the buildings you built. For the number of workers in your castle, based on the tier, one, two, or three points. Four different ribbons are going to give you points from manuscripts. Um, you get bonuses listed on the different some of the cards that you have. Unpaid debts are bad. Deeds are good, or approved deeds flipped over are even better. And then depending on if you got the poverty card or the uh, most deeds card, extra points there. Whoever has the most points is the winner. All right, let's talk about components. There certainly is a lot of them. You have these player boards with tons of iconography on it, but it's not so complicated. There's four symbols that match to four different actions, and you'll get what those mean after a while. It takes a bit to understand how this track works a little bit, and I have to say I would have preferred they not put these half cards on here because I found that to be a little confusing with this track here, but it's not too bad. There's piles of stuff. This here is a plastic piece that fits in the middle of the board. You can put the different sections in it. The These in the middle can be placed randomly and they're flipped based on the number of players. I personally wouldn't do them randomly too much because the different trading things, I don't, I played a game where the trading stuff for the same type of goods were right next to each other and I found that to be a little more stale than if they were spread out, but that's very minor. There's tons of buildings and stuff. There's a lot of pieces in this game. Once again, uh, Garfield Games always makes it difficult to fit everything in the box, but it does fit in a box and they use a lot of the same artwork, the Miko art, you will like the Micho, sorry, art here of all the different characters. But you're probably not going to be thinking too much about the characters' faces. You're thinking more about all these symbols and the things that they do on them. There's a lot going on in Viscounts. Um, it is definitely, there's things in line with the other games. The building of buildings reminds me of Paladins. Uh, there's deck building, which has been in many other different games. And of course, the symbology is similar to his other games. But make no mistake, this is a very different game than both Architects and Paladins. And I know easily the question will be asked is how does it compare? Well, I really think you can like one and not like the others. I know a lot of people who like architects aren't a fan of paladins and vice versa. I think Viscounts is, fits closer to people who like paladins. In fact, complexity level, I would put it along the same level there. It is a deck building game, and there's a lot of deck building games that come out this year that use deck building in a different way, and this one does the same thing. You have eight cards that no one else has, one card that, I mean, eight cards that everyone else has, one card that nobody else has. You're putting these together, but you're not like speeding through your deck. You're playing a card on your turn, and there are, in this game, there's a lot of actions that let you discard cards. Normally, I would think, who cares? But because of the nature of Viscounts, discarding cards is a good thing. I'm like, I'm never going to use these. Whatever. Or I don't want to put this in my line right now. There's other rules that when uh, someone else has a clash or, or when someone's uh, Viscount lands in the same space as yours, you can rearrange your cards. Which, if you have a card that gives you a benefit when it drops off the end of the line, you might want to slide it to the end. Not something I use all the time, but it's there. There's some pretty in-depth stuff going on. So on my turn, I have three cards to play. I'm thinking about the number. How far am I going to move my Viscount? What action am I going to take? A lot of times it's a trade action, and that's one of the small things I have about the game is a trade action is pretty quick. You're like, I have six bags, I'll take three gold for that and move on. And that's a pretty quick turn. Then the next person says, well, I'm going to build a building, and I think I'm going to build it, I don't know, should I build it here, here? And you're like, oh man, my trade action was fast, and now I have to wait for everyone else to go before I can do another action. Um, but you pick your action, how far your Viscount goes, you pick your action, and then you pick what you do with it. There's a lot going on. You decide whether you're going to use that card as part of your action. You save your resources. When you build a building, which building are you going to build? Are you going to build one that gives you, uh, that lets you move in a different way, one that lets you use those cards for only one coin, or the ones that give you extra symbols on your board? I find that fascinating. I also love, love the ending of the game, the debts versus deeds, and how if you run through that debt pile, deeds are valuable, and if you run through the deed pile, debts are vi valuable. In one game I played, I had a lot of debts. I was paying them off, but you know it was hard work getting them, but I, I was the only person really doing that. Everyone else was grabbing deeds, and I was sitting there, ha, 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 and indeed it worked out in my favor. They went through the deed pile, 
Debts, 12 points to me. Thank you. That's good. So there's a lot. It is what I call a point salad game. You're getting points for the workers in the middle. You're getting points for the scrolls. You're getting points for debts and deeds. And you're getting points for, you know, all these different things. But uh, if you take away some of this stuff, it is a game where I can see the cogs and the gears, the mechanisms of the game. This is not a game where there's a strong theme in any way. And nowhere is that more evident than moving the people up in the tower. I felt like that was a little fiddly, putting them in the middle. There can only be three people. Sometimes if there's more than three, you need to return one to that person. And that person get some money for having that person return to them at the cost of not getting points at the end. And I just felt like that was a little bit, I found that to be a little, eh. I also thought that the corruption and the purity symbol or whatever those, the black and white discs, that's neat, but it wasn't as exciting as I thought it was. And corruption, moving your corruption token over, feel, felt like it was such a negative thing. And the cards themselves weren't that powerful, I felt, that I would want to push it that often. Those are minor. Overall, the game is good. Like I said, I think it's as complex to me as architects were. But like I said, you want to know where it is in the trilogy? Right now, for me, the trilogy is Paladins, Architects, Viscounts. Now, that does not mean, by any means, that this is a bad game. I think Viscounts is a very good game. It's just that right now, this one is of the three, my least favorite, but that's like third in the best and a good group of trilogy. I do suspect that this could change as time went by because I definitely remember Paladins. The more I played Paladins, the more I liked it. And the second time I took a look at Viscounts, I was like, well, now I know what I'm doing. And it felt much more smoother and comfortable. And I could see more times I go back to Viscounts, the better it gets. So this could be a rating that rises. Also, Viscounts happen to be released in a year where there's a lot of deck builders that do things in a more involved way. Either way, hopefully this video is enough for you to figure out if this is something that interests you. Definitely, we know at this point that Shem Phillips is not a one-time designer. You know, this is of, you know, he has two trilogies. I really think Raiders is only the, the, the really good one of the first trilogy, but a solid third trilogy here. My word. And so that's exciting. So anyway, until next time, I'm Tom Vassell, and you've been watching a review of Viscounts of the West Kingdom on the Dice Tower. Dice Tower Judgment approved.